بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أحسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار In the previous lesson we finished our discussion of the second principle from the four principles and in that principle Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned the argument of the mushrikeen as to why they give devotion to other than Allah and it boiled down to two issues one was seeking nearness to Allah and the second was seeking intercession and that which made them give uluhiyya to other than Allah is that they believed that this was a sabab a sabab that this was a means amongst the means, that they have these means, meaning that these uh, deities, these objects that they worship, that they are a sabab, they are a means to attaining nearness to Allah and winning intercession. And on that basis, they give devotion to them. It wasn't that they believed that they worship them independently or that they believed that they had any control over power or control or power over life and death and benefit and harm but it was simply because they believed that this was a sabab and on that basis they gave them something of uluhiya so the sheikh explained that this what they sought this shafa'a that they are seeking is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has denied and negated in the Quran and also there is a type of intercession which is affirmed in the Qur'an, which has certain conditions that must be fulfilled. And from those conditions are that Allah has given His permission for intercession to be made, and that He is pleased with both the one who is interceding and the one for whom intercession is being made. We also explain the angles from which this is considered shirk, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from them is the fact that a person has to invoke, he has to make dua to other than Allah, and particularly those who are dead in the graves, who cannot hear, and the period of action of amal has been cut off, because in the barzakh, the taklif, meaning the responsibility, the burden of action has been cut off. And so these people are invoked with dua, which is, only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondly, they are asked for something over which they have no control or power. Which is intercession? Only Allah has control over intercession. And so therefore to ask them that which they have no power and ability for, on top of making dua to them, which they do not hear, and especially when it is from a distance, all of this is clear, clear shirk. And then in addition to that, it is a challenge to Allah's authority because no one can intercede with Allah except after he has given permission and except after he is pleased. So from all of these angles, we can see that this is a grave and serious mistake. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he judged such people as we saw in the verses quoted by Sheikh, Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, as being people of kufr and people of kathib, uh, people who, uh, upon disbelief, people who tell lies, and likewise people of shirk. So today we're going to start the uh, third principle, and we'll read the text of the third principle first, inshallah ta'ala, and translate it. Now the text is quite uh, long compared to the uh, previous uh, texts and so this may take maybe 10-15 minutes of the lesson so we'll start uh, Al-Qa'idatul Thalitha 
القاعدة الثالثة the third principle أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ظهر على أناس متفرقين في عباداتهم that the prophet the third principle that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that he appeared to a people who were diverse in their acts of worship in the acts of worship they were directing these acts of worship to diverse deities to different di- de- deities minhum man ya'budu al-malaika amongst them were those who worshiped the angels wa minhum man ya'budu al-anbiya wa salihin and min and amongst them were those who worshiped the prophets and the righteous wa minhum man ya'budu al-ashjar wa al-ahjar amongst them were those who worshiped the trees and the stones wa minhum man ya'budu ash-shams wa al-qamar and amongst them were those who worship the sun and the moon wa qatalahum rasul allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jami'an wa lam yufarriq baynahum and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he fought against them he fought against them all and he did not distinguish between any of them and then he says then he continues to bring the uh, evidences in this regard so he said uh, wa dalil wa qawluhu ta'ala the evidence is the statement of allah the exalted وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ And fight them until there is no more tribulation and until the religion, all of it, is for Allah. وَدَلِيلُ الشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى And as for the evidence of the sun and the moon, meaning the prohibition, of worshipping the sun and the moon and that there was a people who worshiped the sun and the moon is the saying of he's saying the most high wamin ayatihi al-layl wan-nahar wash-shams wal-qamar from his signs are the night and day and the sun and the moon la tasjudu lil-shams wala lil-qamar do not prostrate to the sun or the moon wasjudu lillahi alladhi khalaqahunna in kuntum iyahu ta'budun do not prostrate to the sun or the moon but prostrate to allah the one who created them if indeed you worship him alone wa dalilul malaika and the evidence with respect to the angels is qawluhu ta'ala is his saying the most high wa la ya'murukum an tattakhidhu al malaika wa an nabiyyin arbaba he does not command you that you take the angels and the prophets as lords wa dalilul anbiya qawluhu ta'ala and likewise the evidence with respect to the prophets is his the most high saying wa id qala allah ya isa ibn maryam a anta qulta lin nas ittakhiduni wa ummiya ilahayni min dunillah when allah said oh when allah said o oh isa the son of maryam did you say to the people a anta qulta lin nas ittakhiduni wa ummiya ilahayni min dunillah did you say to the people take me and my mother as two deities besides allah qala subhanaka ma yakunu li an aqula ma laysa li bihaqqin he said glory be to you sublime are you it is not for me that i should say what i have no right to say in kuntu qultuhu faqad alimta if i had said it you would indeed have known it ta'lamu ma fi nafsi wa la a'lamu ma fi nafsik innaka anta 'allamu al-ghuyub you know that which is in my soul and i do not know that which is in yourself indeed you are the knower of all of the unseen and then he continues wa dalil as-salihin and the evidence for the righteous is the saying is he saying the statement of allah ulaika alladhina yad'una yabtaghuna ila rabbihim alwasila ayyuhum aqrab 
ويرجون رحمته ويخافون عذابه those whom they call upon themselves seek neenness to their lord they seek neenness to their they seek a means of neenness to their lord to see which of them is closer and they hope in his mercy and they fear his punishment وَدَلِيلُ الْأَشْجَارِ وَالْأَحْجَارِ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى And as for the evidence with respect to trees and stones is, is his, the Most High saying, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّى Have you seen اللَّات and الْعُزَّى وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى And Manat, the other third one. These are deities of the, of the Arabs. And some of them were, were trees and some of them were, were stones. And then Shaykh Islam continues, وَحَدِيثُ أَبِي وَاقِدٍ اللَّيْثِ رضي الله عنه, The hadith of Abu Waqid in Al-Layfi, who said, قَالَ خَرَجْنَا مَعَ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى حُنَيْن وَنَحْنُ هُدَثَاءُ أَحْدٍ بِكُفْرٍ We set out with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to Hunayn. And we were recently, we had only recently left disbelief. وَلِلْمُشْرِكِينَ سِدْرَةٌ يَعْكُفُونَ عِنْدَهَا وَيَنُوطُونَ بِهَا أَسْلِحَتَهُمْ يُقَالُ لَهَا ذَاتُ عَنْوَاطٍ The mushrikeen, the pagans, had a tree. There was a low tree. And they would spend time around it. And they would also hang their weapons upon it. It was called ذَاتُ عَنْوَاطٍ فَمَرَرْنَا بِسِدْرَةٍ فَقُلْنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ اجعل لنا ذات انواط كما لهم ذات انواط so we passed by a sidra another low tree and we said o oh, messenger of allah make for us a ذات انواط just as they have a ذات انواط to the end of the hadith so this is the text of the principle i will start with the commentary of sheikh zaid al madkhali and he begins by saying that this is the third principle from these four principles in which we see clearly the meaning of Tawheed being manifest and in which we see the encouragement and enticement to Tawheed and also an explanation of the shirk of the mushrikeen an explanation of its various forms, different forms and types, and warning from it at the same time. He says, this principle, as has been mentioned by the author, Rahimahullah, that the Prophet ﷺ was sent by Allah, Allah sent him, whilst the people were all separated in their worship, meaning that they were all worshipping different things. And likewise in their religions. And likewise in their madhahib, like in, in their doctrine. So basically they were of many different orientations, many different types of worship, in belief, in aqidah. Despite all of this difference, they were united upon one thing. And that is al-ishraku billah. Associating partners with Allah, tabaraka wa ta'ala. Even if the things that they were worshipping were different. So they worshipped many different deities. They weren't all worshipping the same thing. They had their own deities. And despite all this variation, there was one description that combined all of them. And this is that they are mushrikun. Mushrikun. So the author, Rahimullah, mentioned, Shaykh al-Islam, that amongst them were people who worshipped the angels. And they would make representations of these angels and call upon them thinking that they were the angels or that they represented the angels. And so they began to worship them. They began to make oaths for the, to them. They began to make sacrifice for them. And they used to make istighatha, seek rescue from them. And used to seek aid from them. And would seek help from them in bringing about benefits and repelling the harms. Those which are only sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise amongst them were those who worshipped the prophets and the righteous and they wanted from them to bring about the benefits and repel the harms, those which only Allah has power and control over. Who is Al-Wahid Al-Qahar. 
And amongst them were those who worshipped the trees and the stones, as we, as was the case with the kuffar of Quraysh and the Arabs and the various factions amongst them. And we see that until even one of them from, from amongst the Arabs, when they, when they desired to travel, they used to carry stones with them. They used to carry stones. And some of these stones they would use uh, as part of, for example, when they, had, when, when they would cook, for example, and they had pots and they wanted to make pots, they would reserve some of those stones for their utensils. And then other stones, they would turn them into deities and worship them, besides Allah. And this really shows the extent of their jahl, of their ignorance, the evil ignorance, in that they would use some of these stones for, uh, you know, the, the things that they needed to use them for, the utilities, and others they would turn into deities and worship them besides Allah. And in fact, in other cases, they would even eat some of those that they had made into deities. For example, they would make a date, a date, worship it. And then when they'd finished from that, and they had no need of it with, with respect to that, then they would eat the date. And this shows the extent of the ignorance and the misguidance of these people. And this is not strange because, as the Sheikh says, there is nothing that can save a person from such jahl except knowledge, except ilm. And so long as they had no ilm, had no knowledge, then the shayateen could inspire them and dictate to them and beautify for them the speech and lead them into the likes of this misguidance which they saw nothing wrong with. And likewise amongst them were those who worshipped the trees, uh, the worship the uh, sun and the moon. And these are the people like the Sabia, the Sabaeans. And whoever was like them, they would turn to the sun and the moon and other planetary bodies or the stars, for example. Allah wa ta'ala is the creator of the sun and the creator of the moon. And there are many, many benefits from the sun and the moon. Some of which we know and others which, which, we, which we don't know. And there are so many that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best all of the benefits which mankind receives from the sun and the moon. And the people who specialize in this field, uh, you know, uh, the informers of some of these uh, benefits from the sun and the moon, the gravitational pull of the moon, its effect upon the oceans, the heat from the sun, the light from the sun, and so many other things uh, which, which are there. But these are affairs that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And so these are subjected for the use of mankind. They are subjected for the use of mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned some of these benefits in the Qur'an, such as the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِلًا That the moon we have made into stages, meaning, meaning here referring here to the various measurements of time that the moon is used for. And likewise, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا that he made the sun to be a blazing lamp, like a lamp. And likewise, his statement, وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَحَاجَ Again, we made it an illuminating lamp. And likewise, he also said, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمُ اللَّيْلَ سَرْمَدَا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ إِلَاهٌ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِدِيَاءٍ أَفَلَا تَسْمَعُونَ Say, do you not consider that if Allah was to make upon you the night to be permanent up until the day of judgment, which deity besides Allah would bring you light? Will you then not listen? Say, do you not see? If Allah should make upon you the day to be permanent until the day of judgment, which deity besides Allah will bring you the night in which you can rest? Do you not see? So he will see in these, uh, in, in, in these uh, verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned to us some of the benefits of the sun and the moon. 
So a people known as the Sabi'ah used to worship uh, the sun and the moon. And so this, these are the different types of deities. These are the different types of deities. So then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned and warned against taking uh, the sun and the moon as deities. So he said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اللَّيْلُ وَالنَّهَارِ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ لَا تَسْجُدُوا لِلشَّمْسِ وَلَا لِلْقَمَرِ وَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَهُنَّ إِن كُنْتُمْ إِيَّاهُ تَعْبُدُونَ from his signs are the night and the day, the sun and the sun and the moon. Do not prostrate to the sun, nor to the moon, but prostrate to Allah, the one who created them, if indeed you, if indeed it is him that you worship alone. Now from this verse, uh, we can stop and pause on this verse, because this verse, when we look at the things mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the night and the day, and the sun and the moon. We have the sun and the moon and the night and the day. And these are phenomena, phenomena which are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are from the ways and the means. They are from the created asbab. The sun is a created entity. The moon is a created entity. The phenomenon of night and day. The alternation of the night and day involves the sun. The sun provides the light for the day and the absence of the light of the sun produces the, the is, 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 is the night, is the darkness, is the night. And these are from the ways and the means, the asbab. And these are affairs which every single human being observes, observes and witnesses. There is no human on this planet except that he witnesses the night and the day and the sun and the moon. And so this is from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which every single human can recognize and can see. So it is futile to worship the ways and the means, those things that Allah has created and made them to be ways and means and causes and effects and to be the basis of benefits that we benefit from. For that reason, it is futile to worship anything which is created. Anything in the creation, it is futile to direct worship to it. Whether it be stones, trees, wood, the phenomena like the clouds, the mountains, or the rain, or the wind, or the lightning, or the thunder, and all of the entities that we, that we see, the animals or the human beings, it is futile to worship them, futile to worship them. Worship them. But here in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the sun and the moon because they are from the most visible of the signs. And likewise, the night and the day, they are from the most visible of the signs. And that's why in the Quran, when you see the arguments, the rational argument to argue for Allah's existence, for example, or to argue for the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or to argue for tawheed, the truth and justice of tawheed, and the futility of shirk, you see that these are always the most apparent and plain of signs that are visible to every single person. To every single person. And the arguments are very plain and clear. The sun and moon are subjected. We, we see them following a course, a pattern that they do not deviate and swerve from. And that they are subjugated for the benefit of mankind. These are clear signs. And so this shows that they are not to be worshipped. Rather the one who created them, the one who put these entities mm -hmm. and these causes and these effects and these ways and these means all of them interconnected and tied together in the most perfect of ways to enable life, to enable all these benefits, to enable all these enjoyments. That he is the one who is worthy of worship. He is the one who is worthy of prostration and nothing else uh, besides him. So therefore, after the, 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 the sheikh, then after mentioning this ayah that we, that we discussed here, he says, so the pagans who worshipped other than Allah, uh, who worshipped all these deities, different types of deities, all of them 
were guilty of the same thing, which is that they directed ibadah, worship to other than Allah. So even though they were all worshipping different things, the angels, the prophets, the trees, the stones, the sun, the moon, the righteous, and so on and so forth, that which combines all of them is directing ibadah to other than Allah. And this is the issue that counts. As for what it is they are worshipping, that could be anything. That could be diverse and varied, it could be anything. And so what the real, the real issue here is the fact that they are directing worship to other than Allah. And this was what made them to be mushrikeen with the shirk on account of which the Prophet Sallallahu he, you know, he invited them and then he fought against them. And he did not distinguish between any one party or the other uh, in this regard. You know, between the ones who are worshipping the sun or the moon or the trees or the stones or the righteous or the prophets. All of this was shirk and all of this was evil. It was evil what they were doing. Then the Shaykh goes on to mention the ayah that Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin al mentioned with respect to Isa alayhi salam, referring to the worship of prophets. And so he comments upon this verse, and this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say on Yawmul Qiyamah to Isa alayhi salam, did you say to the people to take me and my mother, meaning Isa and his mother, as deities besides Allah? In this ayah, the Shaykh says, is an explanation that the prophets and righteous are not to be called upon. Uh, that, they, uh, that, that they never in fact called the people to worship them, nor did they call the people to exaggerate in them, nor did they call the people to ask them for the fulfillment of their needs. Why? Because the prophets are the purest of people in Tawheed. They are the most intense of people in venerating and respecting Allah, the majesty of Allah. So how can it be, how could they ever ask others to worship them, or to invoke them, or to make exaggeration in them, or to ask them for fulfill, fulfill, fulfillment of their needs? This is impossible. So, the prophets are exonerated for, may, for saying such things, and they will free themselves from saying such things. However, it is the people, it is the people who Iblis invites to Ghulu, he causes them to make exaggeration in the righteous, the prophets, the Rusul, the messengers, the Salihin. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned here that Isa Islam was not pleased that he should be taken as a deity besides Allah. And for that reason Allah has informed us in this ayah that he will free himself on Yawmul Qiyamah. And he will say that it was not for me. مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أَقُولْ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِحَقْ it is not for me that I should say that I should say that which I have no right to say, <coughs> which is, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah. He will say that I had no right to say this. And so this means that this it is not possible for the likes of this statement to appear from any of the prophets and messengers of Allah because they are the most knowledgeable of their Lord. And similarly, every righteous person who is worshipped besides Allah, the person who is a righteous, a genuine righteous person, and he is worshipped besides Allah, he will free himself as well. He will free himself from those worshippers, and he will not acknowledge their worship, and as a result, because he was a genuine person upon Tawheed, he never asked to be worshipped besides Allah, then the sin of those people will not fall upon him. But those are the people who will carry the great sin, the mighty sin upon their shoulders, and they are the ones who will be blamed, and they are the ones who will be subjected to punishment from Allah. And they are the very ones to whom the prophets and messengers were sent, and they waged, uh, you know, this, this strove against them. And likewise, all of the followers of the prophets strive against such people in every age and in every place. Then after this, Shaykh al-Islam mentioned the evidence for righteous people, meaning that there were those who used to worship the righteous people. The statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ يَبْتَغُونَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمُ الْوَسِيلَةِ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ Those whom they call upon themselves seek a means of needless to their Lord to see which of them is closest. 
they hope in his mercy and they fear his uh, punishment so regarding this is that the righteous the sheikh says that the righteous who are called upon in all their various levels who are called upon besides Allah they themselves are hoping in Allah's mercy ta'ala they themselves are hoping in nearness to Allah they themselves are hoping in forgiveness from Allah and they are hoping that Allah will accept their righteous actions and likewise they themselves are not able to have any control over uh, you know bringing people closer to Allah or to make shafa'a or to bring about any benefit or to repel any harm they are helpless in this regard because all of these affairs belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather what we see from them as mentioned in this ayah that they are in fact racing and competing with each other by way of righteous actions so that uh, uh, so, 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 that, so that what Allah has mentioned so that what Allah has mentioned about them that they are hoping in his mercy and they are fearing his punishment that they, that they attain this meaning that they are doing righteous actions competing with each other so that what Allah has mentioned about them will actually come to them Allah has mentioned about them that they are hoping in his mercy and that they are fearing his punishment and so they do these righteous, righteous actions so that this will be attained by them, meaning that they receive the mercy of Allah and that they are saved from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the way, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is the way of the righteous people. This is the way of the righteous people. The people of Tawheed, they worship Allah so that Allah becomes pleased with them and they fulfill what Allah has commanded them and so that, uh, they, they, they are also people of khawf and raja, people of fear and hope at the same time. And all of these are from the great forms of worship, the great acts of worship of the heart, which take place in the heart. And hoping in Allah and fearing from Him, this is the way of the people of iman, the people of truth, and they combine between these two things. So, uh, the shaykh goes on to mention here the conditions for the action to be acceptable to Allah and he says it is that which is correct, meaning in accordance with the sunnah, and that which is sincerely for Allah's sake. And then the shaykh mentions a third point, which is sihhatul mu'taqad. Sihhatul mu'taqad, which is a sound belief. Now why did he add this? Why has the shaykh added a third condition on top of what we know to be the standard two conditions? Meaning, that you are sincere in your action and that you do the action in accordance with the sunnah. The reason is, especially in our time, that there are many people who are on a corrupt belief. These people, they pray and they fast and they might be adhering to the sunnah and they might even, in those actions they perform, they might even be sincerely, they might even be sincere to Allah. Their niyyah is to please Allah. However, their actions are not accepted because of a corrupt belief, because they believe in, they, they, they give devotion to other than Allah, they worship the awliya, they worship the dead. So for example, we might have a man, and he, you know, he, he prays in accordance with the sunnah, he uh, fasts in accordance with the sunnah, he dresses in accordance with the sunnah, his appearance is in accordance with the sunnah, and he goes and he, for example, stands and prays and he makes his niyyah and his niyyah is to please, is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he prays in accordance with the sunnah and then he goes and does righteous deeds. He's righteous towards uh, his parents. He removes something harmful from the floor. He gives charity. He's good to an orphan. He does all of these actions and in each of these actions he wants to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it appears that he's fulfilling the two conditions for an action to be worshipped, to be sincere and to be correct in how the action is done. But, at the same time, he is someone who believes that you can invoke the righteous dead and that they will intercede for you. That you can ask them for rescue when you are in a difficult situation. That you can ask them to bring about benefit to you and repel harm from you. 
and he is upon this. So, is the condition of sincerity, and is the condition of being in accordance with the sunnah, having correct niyyah, and being in accordance with that, are they sufficient? And so in this case we see clearly that would not be the case, and for that reason, Sheikh Zayd al-Madkhili, and likewise some of the other scholars in the contemporary period, like Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti, they add a third condition and they say that this is as long as the mu'taqad, the belief is sound. It is not a corrupt belief. Then these two conditions, when they are fulfilled, they, the action of a person will be acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, these are the various uh, conditions uh, by which a person, when he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and after this, he is hoping and fearing. So he fulfills all these conditions, then he hopes and fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he doesn't exaggerate in one aspect over and above the other aspect. So he doesn't exaggerate in hoping for Allah's mercy, and thereby feels secure from the plot of Allah. Nor does he exaggerate in fear, and thereby despair of the mercy of Allah. But he combines between the two of them, and as he, the example has been given, that a person in his fear and hope is like the bird with two wings. Without the two wings, the bird would not be able to fly, and they should be equal in distribution. So the uh, summary of this verse that we are discussing with respect to the salihin, the righteous people, is that so long as those people, so long as uh, the, the, the salihin which I mentioned, that so long as those uh, kuffar, they call upon them and they invoke them, despite the fact that these uh, salihin themselves are seeking nearness to Allah with righteous actions and are hoping in Allah and fearing Allah, then how can they, how can they be requested? How can you make dua and call upon these people and ask them for something which they themselves are requesting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How does that make sense? And this is the proof in the ayah if we were to reflect upon it. This is the argument, the rational argument. That those whom you are calling upon, how can you call upon them and ask them and uh, ask them for something that they themselves do not possess and themselves they are invoking Allah to attain that very same thing? How can that make sense? And how can you therefore worship such people who are in such a condition and situation? So this shows the futility of shirk and for the futility of worshipping uh, the, the righteous and then the final thing mentioned by Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab is the proof for the worship of uh, trees and stones that was done by some of the uh, pagans mm. and the verse in the Quran mm. have you seen Allah and Al-Uzza and the third of them the other third of them Manat these are names of idols that were worshipped by the Arabs, and they were inanimate things. They were made of uh, uh, wood and uh, stone and things of that nature. And they believed that they, there is baraka and there is virtue and excellence. And if they were to hang their weapons, for example, and likewise if, if they were to hang their clothes upon them, they would help them to realize victory against the enemies. So the Prophet, وسلم, he informed them that this is the major shirk, a shirk al-akbar. Because they believe that these inanimate things which have no life, that they can bring about benefits or repel harms. And therefore here, the hadith of Abu Waqid al-Laythi, uh, Abu al-Laythi, is an example, an illustration of that, where some of the sahaba who were new to Islam, and they were the sahaba who, uh, towards the end, uh, of the prophetic seerah, this is when they accepted Islam, towards the end, closer to the conquest of Mecca. So they were the Sahaba who accepted Islam later than the others. And uh, they mentioned here that as they were going to the Battle of Hunayn, they recently left Kufr, and the disbelievers, the mushriks, had a tree upon which they would hang their weapons. 
And as they passed by a tree, a similar tree, they said to the Prophet ﷺ, make for us a tree as they have a tree. And when they said this, the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned to them that they made a grave and serious error, and they fell into the very same thing that Bani Israel fell into with respect to Musa ﷺ, because they asked Musa ﷺ for, the same, for something similar. They said, اجعل لنا إلها كما لهم آلهة قال إنكم قوم تجهلون إن هؤلاء متبر ما هم فيه وباطل ما كانوا يعملون The Bani Israel said to Musa, O Musa, make for us a deity like they have deities. And he said to them, Indeed you are an ignorant people. So, uh, however, this the difference here is that the, the companions, their ignorance uh, was, was, was basically because they were very new to Islam. They'd only recently left uh, Kufr. And they did, not do, they did not actually do what the mushriks did with their trees, and which they used to worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they used to hang their weapons, hoping in their barakah. Um, for that reason, the Prophet did not judge them with disbelief. Because they did not actually perform that. However, they requested something on account of their, uh, on, on account of them being new to Islam and not having ilm, not having knowledge. So the point in all of this is that all of the mushrikeen uh, that were fought against by the Prophet Ali Sallam, all of them worshipped a variety of different deities. From trees, to stones, to prophets, to angels, to the sun, to the moon, to the righteous. And the key thing in all of this is that the Messenger of Allah did not distinguish between any of them. Because the issue is not what they were worshipping. They could be worshipping anything. The issue is the fact that you are worshipping something else alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this concludes the discussion of Sheikh Zayd al-Madkhali, rahimahullah ta'ala. We'll conclude our lesson here today and we'll take up a further discussion and elaboration upon this principle from the speech of some of the other scholars, from Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabari, hafizahullah ta'ala, and likewise Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi in the next lesson. And we'll conclude here for today. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.